All right, Alexander, let's do an update on uh, what is going on in Ukraine. What is the situation on the front lines, Alexander? Well, um, uh, March, uh, I think, was one of the cruelest months for Ukraine in the war so far. Uh, From what I can tell, casualty rates were the worst um, they've been since pretty much the start of the war, at least if you believe the Russian Defence Ministry, which I rather do. Um, There's been a massive series of missile strikes. Now, these have been going on night after night after night. They've been striking at all kinds of centres across Ukraine, uh, decision-making centres, the headquarters of the, uh, uh, you know, positions of the SBU, the Internal Intelligence Agency. They've also um, attacked bunkers like the one, there was one in Chasuk Yar. Many people think that a Polish general who's recently, whose death has recently been confirmed was killed in that strike, and that's possible. We had, if you remember, strikes in on buildings in Odessa, but also now we have a systematic and relentless campaign by the Russians against um, the Ukrainian energy system. And this is on a qualitatively completely different level from what we saw a year ago in 2022-2023, when the Russians were attacking the distribution system. Now they're actually going for power stations. And they're causing enormous, devastating damage. We're seeing the Russians now um, bringing out more and more new types of missiles. And this is a big story in itself because the Zircon hypersonic cruise missile has now joined the various strikes across against Ukraine. And this is a weapon system against which no one in the world has any counter. And it's proving to be devastatingly effective from what we can see. And on top of everything else, the situation on the battlefronts, the actual fighting on the battlefronts, more information about Ukraine getting ground down. The main focus of the Russians increasingly, it's well, it's now clear, is central Donbass. This is where the, inf- the Russian advance is concentrated on. They captured Avdevka there back in February. It looks like two other towns, Pervomaisky, which is a big place, well, big-ish place, 28,000 people before the war, is about to fall. Uh, reports that another town or small or ra- rather big village, but strategically positioned big village, Novomikhailovka, has actually already fallen. I mean, that's what the reports claim. And um, more advances in all sorts of places um, in this area with the Ukrainians steadily running out of men and machines. And there was a rather um, desperate um, commentary on one of the Ukrainian telegram channels, I think it was resident, in which they said that what's happening is that the Ukrainian military are forced to send more and more troops try to hold back the Russian advance on the front lines. The Russians attack them with bombs, missiles, drones, and now robots, and we come to that in a moment. Um, The Ukrainians take staggering losses, and according to the Russian Defense Ministry, Ukraine lost 30,000 men dead and severely wounded in um, March, which I believe is a record. Uh, That's the Russian Defense Ministry figure, I should make that clear. And um, they can't keep up this level of defense for much longer. And there's other reports that if they're pushed back further from various of these places, the roads are now shot through by the Russians. They control the roads um, um, to the rear. And any further Ukrainian retreats will result in even more devastating losses. And last but not least, Budanov comes out and he admits, finally, what many have known, that the Russians have all but completed their big railway lines from Rostov to Crimea. The Crimean Bridge is apparently no longer used to transport military equipment or military goods. And in addition, once that railway line is completed, 
once railway lines that the Russians have now taken control of in um, Avdevka are brought into operation, once other railway lines that the Russians might be eyeing um, and seeking to take control of in places like Chasovya and Siversk uh, also fall under Russian control. That will massively simplify Russian logistic operations and that will pave the way for a very, very much bigger Russian military being deployed in Ukraine than anything we've seen up to this point. So, I mean, overall, it is a horrendous situation. And it's important to say there's absolutely nothing Ukraine can do to turn this round. And I do think they said the West can. Um, they're now talking again of Attackham's missiles being sent to Ukraine. That's not going to change anything, not on the battle lines. The Russians have shown great ability to shoot down missiles. I'm sure they'll be able to shoot down Attackham's missiles. We're talking about Attackham's missiles, 1980s technology, at the time when the Russians are launching Zircon hypersonic missiles. Um, a technology that is completely new um, against Ukraine. I mean, the, the difference is becoming, you know, painful to see. Uh, the F-16s, massive problems with those. And, well, altogether, a very bleak situation. And there was a description um, of Zelensky from David Ignatius. He's all by himself in his building. You know, his headquarters in Kiev, it's sandbagged all around, surrounded by armed guards, and all the civilian officials have gone. So that's the situation now. Yeah, the David Ignatius uh, interview with Zelensky, where uh, Zelensky did uh, throw out there the the possibility of negotiating based on, on the 2022 borders. In essence, Zelensky's talking about the, the negotiations in Turkey. He's kind of saying we could possibly go go back to that. But um, the the attacks on the Crimean Bridge, you're talking about Budanov, that he now admits that the railways have, have been completed. And it is logistics that that uh, win, win wars at the end of the day. But um, it, it was never about hitting the Crimea Bridge. It was The Kirsch Bridge was never about... Uh, military infrastructure. That was the cover that that they were using. It was always about hitting the bridge because it was a symbol of uh, of Putin and the Putin administration. So, I mean, they, they can't use that excuse anymore. If they try to target the, the Kerch Bridge, they can't come out and say that we're hitting military uh, infrastructure because Budanov has now come out and said that the bridge is not uh, going to be used to transfer weapons. It's, it's, it's a civilian bridge, pure and simple. So, I mean, you know, it was never about the attacks on the bridge were never about um, hitting military targets. It was always about trying to weaken the Putin, uh, the Putin government, because that's the connection that they created, the Kerch Bridge with, with Putin. And that's all they have left. That's all the collective West has to, is to try and somehow figure out a way to, to weaken the, the Putin administration. You're absolutely correct. This is the only thing they have. I mean, this is what it has been, of course, all, all the way through, right? All the way back going to, you know, the sanctions war, <laughs> the uh, attempt to destroy the Russian army last year in the summer, the great summer offensive. By the way, David Sachs has done a brilliant tweet on this, just just, just saying, the, you know, the, the, the summer um, offensive. All of this... And they've been, you know, recycling all that. And they're coming. This is this is still what they're talking about. And of course, Zelensky, I mean, he's been giving a number of interviews. He gave the one to David Ignatius. He then gave another one, I believe, to CBS, in which he said essentially the same things. And of course, it's all very well now, you know, going back to 2022, to Istanbul. But it's far too late. And um, he still hasn't taken the step, which is to... Um, rescind the law, the decree which he himself passed, which prohibits negotiations with Russia. So he says this, I mean, he talks about, you know, oh, let's go back to 2022, but we still want our old territories back, all of them, including Crimea. We just, it's just that we accept that we might not be able to get them immediately through military me methods. So, but eventually we must have them back. That's uh, still our purpose. 
and our intention. And, you know, all we need is if you give us, you know, 10,000 tanks and 500,000 missiles, 500,000 attackers' missiles, and whatever crazy things it is that he's asking, we can still win the war for you. We can still defeat the Russians and you have your regime change and all the things that you've always wanted will come true. It is a, a fantastic exercise in self-delusion. Just as you had an equally deluded interview from his top general, General Sirsky now, in which, you know, um, as I said, Pervomaisky is about to fall, Novo Mikhailovka perhaps has already fallen, the Russians are now apparently a few hundred meters from Chasov Yar, uh, the Russians are advancing everywhere, power stations are being blasted across Ukraine, the lights are going out, and Sushki says, well, over the last few weeks, we've actually gained more ground than we've lost. He doesn't say where this ground they've gained is, but still, they can't stop. They can't stop lying. I mean, that's the only thing I could say, fantasizing and pretending that things could still turn out well for them. And Sirsky now admits they can't call up for half a million men because, well, presumably there would be massive protests and opposition in Ukrainian society. So the whole demobilization, rather mobilization effort appears to have collapsed. But the one thing none of these people prepared to do, not Zelensky, not Sirsky, not the Biden administration, not the Europeans. They're not prepared to accept the realities and sit down and think the thing through and say, how do we get out of this mess? The Russians are winning, and they're not just winning. They're winning big. They're also exposing the fact that technologically, far from being this gas station, you know, masquerading as a country, they're ahead of us in certain key technologies. And we, I talked about the uh, Zircon hypersonic missile. Apparently, these missiles carried out, and mis they were the missiles that were used to carry, the, carry out the missile strike on the SBU building in Kiev, uh, in Kiev. And they traveled from the Black Sea. They were launched from ships in the Black Sea. And they reached Kiev in six minutes. Six minutes. I mean, that's the distance of, I think it's about 700 kilometers. I mean, the, the, the speed of these things is astonishing. There is no um, um, air defense missile in the world that can shoot them down. And apparently, when the, they move so fast that they create a plasma uh, cover around them, which means that they're pretty much invisible to radars as well. So, the West has nothing at the moment like that in its arsenal. One day it will, but at the moment it doesn't. And now we see robots actually being used for the first time. I mean, these must be AI-based. I wonder how the Russians uh, were able to use AI rob produce AI ro robots. But AI robots are now starting to appear on the battlefronts, with the Russians launching an attack with these machines in um, a village called Berdichi. And you see the, the film of this, and it's literally, it looks like something straight out of Terminator 2. It is creepy. But, you know, all of this is stacking up. All of these problems are stacking up. The Russians are ahead in uh, ammunition production, in drone production, in AI applications on the battlefronts. But nobody talks peace or negotiations or tries to find some way out. And there's been a really extraordinary piece by uh, David Goldman in um, Asia Times, in which he again attended a meeting of all these top people in the US foreign policy and defense establishment. And, you know, they're all talking about, you know, we must double down and triple down, and find some way to escalate the war and achieve victory and humiliate Russia and break Russia and break Putin and engineer regime change there. They're still stuck on all of this, even as everything falls apart around them. It's um, a story of delusion in Kiev, of delusion in Washington, of delusion in Brussels, and I don't see any end to it. It's most astonishing.
break Putin. It's, it's what we started this entire conflict with, and, and that's where they still are, is, is to break Putin, to break Russia apart. That's what got them into into this mess. But yeah, uh, ter- Terminator 2, huh? It's a s- scary stuff to, oh, it's just to see the robots I mean, in, in action. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. It's, it's, sca- it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's interesting, but it's also scary. Yeah. Yeah. It is scary, but I mean, you know, there, there they are. I mean, you know, you, there's films of them, and apparently, I mean, we've seen film of two in action, but it seems that the total number of these uh, robots that um, took part in this fight was about ten, and this is only a test run. <laughs> apparently, there's hundreds coming. And, it's historic uh, you know, in a in a sense, isn't it? Uh, it I is mean... historic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the Russians did it first. Now, you know, I'm not uh, saying, you know, that the U.S. won't do it too. Of course they will. But the Russians did it first and they're doing it in Ukraine and they've got these um, robots now coming off the production lines. I'm sure you visited a big factory in uh, the Altai region, which is in uh, Siberia. We don't know quite what it produces, but he talks. He, he's talking there about the enormous expansion of the factory. I wonder whether this is the factory where these robots have been made, by the way, because uh, there was so much uh, secrecy about the nature of the factory and so much priority given to its expansion that, you know, I do wonder. Okay, so there are reports that uh, Speaker Johnson is uh, going to to put a... Uh, an aid package to the House up for a vote. The aid package is going to have money to Israel, but it's also going to have money to Ukraine. And it's, most of the money will be towards Ukraine. We don't know the amount, and there, there are rumors floating around as to how Johnson's going to approach this. But he definitely wants to wants to bundle package with a package of, of aid to Israel with Ukraine. And he, he's working with the Democrats. From what I understand, he's working with the Democrats to try and get bipartisan support. So that they can put this uh, this package up for a vote. Um, if it does go up for a vote in the House, I imagine it will pass, and I imagine that money will will go to to Project Ukraine. Once again, we don't know the amount. Maybe sixty one billion, maybe less than sixty one billion. But if if Ukraine can't mobilize, if they can't mobilize, they have pro- they have problems mobilizing the money that's going to to go to to Project Ukraine from the U.S. I imagine most of it is just going to go to the military industrial complex of the United States so that they can restock everything that they've lost to Ukraine. And they'll probably get rid of a lot of their their older stuff and they'll give it to to the Zelensky regime. But most of the money is going to remain in the United States. How how does Ukraine get out of this then? I mean, this is not they can't mobilize any troops. Sixty-one billion. It's not going to go into into the accounts of of Zelensky. Zelensky's not going to have sixty-one billion in an account in Kiev. Most of the money, if not all of the money, is going to stay in the in the U.S. So, is is Zelensky just trying to to figure out a way to to, to get out of this mess to to find an exit? Because we do see a lot of his staff is is mysteriously. I think it's mysterious. Is getting fired. I think they're asking to leave. But any, anyway, what are your what are your thoughts? Because when you step back and see the situation, there there is no no war really left to fight. At least in the next year or two. I mean, maybe they have another year left in them. But but that's it. If you can't mobilize, you can't get weapons. You your economy's collapsing. I mean. Yeah, it, 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 let's just talk briefly about the aid appropriation. I mean, the aid appropriation is what we've discussed many times. It's all about domestic American politics. It's not ultimately about Ukraine. The administration wants to fasten the blame on the Republicans for the coming debacle in Ukraine. The Republicans, for their part, want to make it absolutely clear to Americans that they're fighting the course of security on the border, but they don't want to be, um, you know, blamed for the coming collapse in Ukraine. So something will be packaged and something will be uh, approved and there will be more money and it will be nowhere near enough. 
And what it is, as you rightly say, will go mostly to restock the Pentagon's own stocks and um, Ukraine will be provided with some more handouts. But in the crucial area of shells, for example, and other things like that, they're not going to get anything that's going to turn things around. And just before I proceed with that, you remember there was this um, new plan of President Pavel of the Czech Republic, 800,000 shells that were going to be found on the international arms market. They're already complaining that the prices are rising, that they can't get all the shells that they promised. It's unlikely most of them will arrive before the end of the year. I mean, exactly what we said would happen. That plan also is turning to dust. So you're absolutely right. This is just this this whole business of this aid package. It's, it's ephemeral. It has no real reality to it. It is a mirage. It is a, um, a media meme more than anything else. What does Zelensky do? Well, he is, I think, trapped inside his own rhetoric. If you read the article with David Ignatius, who, whatever you may think of him, is clearly a clever man. I mean, he says at one point that um, Zelensky has come to inhabit as an actor the role <laughs> which he has been given. He can't break free of it. So he's this heroic Che Guevara figure in this, you know, T-shirt, whatever it is. He's going to lead the defense of Ukraine. Um, and he just continues reciting these lines. Sometimes he does this, you know, with huge bursts of optimism. Other moments he falls into depression. But he can't really escape the role. And as you correctly say, all the people around him are now, sc are now running away. <laughs> I mean, they're all bolting. So a few days ago, we had announcements that um, virtually the entire civilian staff that um, works with him, all his civilian advisors. These are people who were with him from the moment he was elected, including a man called Sefir, who was his chief advisor. They've all said, you know, we're, we're off, we're going, we're leaving. And that's exactly what we've done. Now, then we had, uh, um, uh, if you bef before that, we had Danilov. He was supposed to become ambassador to, Mo to Norway. He's now been demoted. He's been made ambassador to Moldova. I think he must be bitterly angry with that, by the way. I mean, Norway would have been a nice, cushy place. Moldova, hardly so. But anyway, they are, they are, they are abandoning. They're, they're bailing out. They're, I mean, that is what it looks like. And realistically, what else can they do? Because it's clear that Zelensky has no plan. All he has is lines. That's all he has. He just reads out the same lines. He has no plan. He can't produce a plan. That's not what Zelensky does. And the people who might produce a plan, the Americans or the Europeans, well, for all kinds of complex reasons, which we don't need to go into in great detail, they're incapable of producing a plan either. Well, ultimately, because... They've allowed an obsession with Vladimir Putin to completely warp their understanding and their thinking. So, you know, obsessive people cannot plan. And besides, they're hopelessly inadequate, as we've often discussed. I just wonder how they're going to get out of this. I really am curious how they're, they're going to get out of this, yeah. They'll, they'll blame they'll blame each other. This is what they'll do. They'll say, you know, that it's the Republicans who are to blame, and the Republicans will say it's the Biden administration who is to blame, and the neocons will say it's everyone that everyone is to blame because we didn't start World War Three. There's even one senator who's come out apparently and said, you know, we should go all full, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki on this one. You know, not just. Uh, about Ukraine, but about Gaza as well. I mean, when people start talking in this way, then you understand that the, the options are running out and that they're becoming very angry and very unbalanced and desperation is setting them. Well, the, the U.S., as we've always said, the U.S. is, uh, just to wrap it up, the, the U.S. can get out of this because eventually... Uh, 
people in the U.S. are going to forget about uh, a debacle in Ukraine and in much the same way they've forgotten about the debacle in Afghanistan. Yes, the debacle in Ukraine is going to be magnitudes bigger and more embarrassing, but eventually after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, people will forget about it. It's the Europeans. The Europeans, they're going to be, they're going to be uh, stuck with, with this uh, catastrophe. No, they are stuck with this catastrophe. They are suffering with this catastrophe. If you look at the yeah, economic numbers of the UK, of Germany. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's interesting you say that because today in the Financial Times, there's a long piece about how the German government is warning people to beware of Russian misinformation. And they say one of the main major problems with a lot of this Russian misinformation is that it is unfalsifiable. In other words, it's true. In other words, uh, it is in fact the case that the German economy, with all this information, is saying is actually going down the tubes. So you can't actually deny that, but you mustn't listen to it because it's still misinformation. It, it, it's a most bizarre article if you read it in the Financial Times. And, and Sunak's uh, government, they, they said that it has been in a recession for like the past year. They, kind of, they admitted that as well. So so, yeah. so so there goes yeah, the talk I, I, about uh, about the UK is not affected or not connected to any of the sanctions against Russia. We're we're completely isolated from any of the of the business activity that goes on between Russia and Europe. That's that's been proven false as well. So well, obviously, <laughs> what can I say? I'm not going to say more than that. Obviously, so yeah. All right, we will uh, end it there. The Durand Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Pitchu, Telegram, Rockfin. And Twitter X and go to the Durant shop, uh, pick up some uh, limited edition merch. Link down below in the description box. Take care.